Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God keeps covenant with his people. That means that God's word that he has promised, he is going to fulfill. His faithfulness is going to be manifested to his people. And that is exactly what we see in this 30th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. Take out your Bible and please look to that location. The book of Isaiah and chapter 30. Now, we completed last week the first half of this chapter. And we have said, as so many times we have in studying the book of Isaiah, that God is simply not pleased with his people. The people are uninterested in the things of God. God wants to redeem. He wants to manifest his love. He wants to be gracious and merciful. He's willing to forgive, but once more, his people are simply uninterested in the things of God. Now, even though Israel will suffer for such an attitude, God will keep covenant. He will move and he will bring about a heart change among the people. How is he going to do that? through discipline, through judgment, through adversity. And all of this adversity is for the purpose of bringing the people to repentance. And God's faithfulness to bring about a change in the people shows and manifests his steadfast love for his covenant people. Not just the covenant we read about in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, but as God displays his faithfulness to that covenant, he is also assured for us to keep covenant with a New Testament, a new covenant people. And that should be a source of great encouragement. Now, the first verse that I wanted to do today is verse 18. We completed the first 17 verses last week, but in order to really appreciate what we're going to study, what's going to be revealed to us, I want to go back and read one verse from last week, and that is verse 15. So look there with me, Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 15. We see a, a statement, a promise. We read, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. Now, again, and I make mention of this frequently, if your Bible says, thus says, it's incorrect. It is not the word omer, but the word amar. It is in the past. And what's the significance of this? What God is saying from his standpoint it has already taken place, meaning he is absolutely committed to bringing this about. And what does he say? Thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in the return. Now, this is related to the word repentance, but here it's more correctly translated, that he's going to bring about a return. And it could also refer to his return to the people, that he is going to renew his presence, his activity among the people. And he's going to do so by giving in this word here, the word va-nachat, and rest, or and retribution. It can be the word for, for bringing about a, a vengeance, 
But here it's not upon Israel. It's upon the enemies of Israel. And in doing so, the people will finally be given that rest that they inwardly so passionately need and want, but their actions do not relate to this. But God's going to move to bring about this change. And he says, look in the middle of verse 15, and you will be saved. So God is returning. He is going to bring about retribution upon, and the context is the enemies of Israel. And in this deliverance, Israel's going to be saved. They're going to be saved in quietness, meaning they're not bringing it about. It's not through their deeds, their activities. It's not them fighting the enemy, but God himself is going to do so in their quietness and in trusting. And this is a word for showing dependence. He says, this shall bring about your might, your power. And this word for might or power is related to the power for salvation to come into the people, for them to take hold of the outcome of this deliverance, being a victorious people. But what's the problem? What did we learn? Notice how this verse ends. It has all of this good message, but it says, Velo aviten, but you did not want You did not desire this. You did not in any way respond with a a desire for God to move in this way. So instead of that, the people are going to go into a very long and a very hard exile. Now, when we speak about exile, frequently we will remember what took place nearly 2,000 years ago, in the year 70 AD, with the Roman exile. The destruction of the temple, which has not been rebuilt, the destruction of Jerusalem, and this exile, the Roman exile, that went from 70 AD until the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. But we need to remember something. Before the the Roman exile, there was even a longer exile. And I'm speaking about the Assyrian exile. Now, this took place, remember, we all know and think about Nebuchadnezzar and him coming and taking captive the Jewish people back to Babylon and as well Like the Romans under Titus, Nebuchadnezzar also destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem. But what do we know? The Babylonian exile lasted 70 years, but the Assyrian one on those northern tribes in that northern kingdom called Israel, in many ways, that that took place not in 70 AD, but in the year 722 B.C. So we're talking about nearly 800 years previously, and we have not seen a true restoration from that Assyrian exile. When we look prophetically, we know something. We know that, for example, Ezekiel speaks of this, that God is going to bring about a reunification between all the tribes. He is going to bring Ephraim, a name for the northern kingdom. He is going to bring Ephraim and Judah together. And this is seen as the final redemption, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, the capital Jerusalem, in bringing about Yomot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah, and we're speaking here of the millennial kingdom. So now we're going to see in the second half of chapter 30, a great prophecy of God restoring all of his people. 
And when I say all of his people, I'm speaking about representatives from all the tribes coming back into forming a nation, a kingdom nation, and also there's going to be a remnant of the nations. That's speaking about, in other words, the church full of many Gentiles, this ecclesia, these ones who were responding to the message of the gospel, both Jew and Gentile, but predominantly Gentile. And there's going to be a renewal back to the purpose, the intent, the plan of God, that Israel would be a congregation of peoples, both Jew and Gentile, that the house of God, the temple would be a house of prayer for all peoples. And that is going to bring be brought about when the nations see, a remnant, of course, of the nations see God's faithfulness to Ephraim, to that northern kingdom. And so we see a judgment prophetically and also symbolically on Assyria, but it's not dealing with a time going back nearly 3,000 years ago, 2,800 years ago, with the Assyrian nation, but using Assyria, this large, and by the way, the Assyrian Empire reached a landmass much larger than Babylon. It was massive. It reflected the world in one sense. So Assyria can be used for speaking about this Antichrist empire that is going to, to encompass the world. Let's begin where we left off in verse, verse 18. God has just said, the people did not want to respond to me, so what is he going to do? Replace Israel? Cast Israel away? No, we read, therefore the Lord he will wait. He is not canceling the covenant. He is not rejecting and replacing the people. He is going to wait. So therefore the Lord will wait to be gracious unto you or for your grace, meaning for the outpouring of your grace. And therefore he will be and I believe that this is a reference to the cross, he will be lifted up, raised up. Now, it can also be the concept of exalted, but exalted in the fact that the Son of God would lay down his life for, for you and me, for his people. So we read, Therefore the Lord will wait to be gracious unto you, Therefore, he will be lifted up for your mercy. And we see this, this correlation between the grace of God and the mercy of God. For the God of justice is the Lord. And happy or blessed, this word ashre, a very important word parallel to the New Testament word where we get the concept of the Beatitudes. Blessed is the one, or happy is the one. It's a, a combination of being blessed and the feelings that you have because of that blessing being received by you. So happy are the ones, blessed are the ones, all who wait upon him. Wait upon who? God, but the commentaries agree that this is waiting for God to move in bringing the Redeemer, bringing his Messiah. So we see there's a connection between Messiah and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the expectation to be waiting for him. Verse 19, for a people in Zion. Here again, these words are so important in teaching us rightly how to interpret because Zion, Zion is a kingdom word. We're speaking about the location of Jerusalem, but in a state, a different state. And what is that state? The state of redemption. So Zion is Jerusalem redeemed. He says, look again at verse 19, 
for a people in Zion will dwell. In Jerusalem, crying will no longer be. Crying will be cut off. And, and with grace, he will be gracious unto you. To the voice or the sound of your scream, you crying out, yelling. When he hears, it says, he answered you. Now, most Bibles put it into the future. He will answer you because it's a future event. But in the Hebrew, it's in the past to show this is going to happen. This is assured. God has already in his mind, he's already seen it fulfilled because God transcends time. So when the past is used in regard to a future event, it's to teach us that this is certainly going to take place. So God's going to respond to the, the yelling, the screams, the crying out of the people, and he is going to, to bring about, he is going to be gracious to them. Verse, verse 20. And the Lord, this is a term Adonai, my master, my Lord, for the Lord. He will give to you bread, which is terrible. Now, it's the bread of affliction, lechem tsar. And also wine, mime, which is water, lachatz, which is pressure, anxiety. And the ideal here is bread that's not good, water that is putrid. And bread and water, which is not good, represents a time of suffering. So what the scripture is saying is this. God has this wonderful promise to be gracious, to be merciful, that he is going to hear your cries and he's going to respond. But in order to bring this about, Israel's going to go through a very difficult time. They use the word tsar, which is trouble. We all know the phrase, et sarah hile Yaakov, a time of trouble to Jacob. Same word. And the word lachatz, as I said, pressure, anxiety, stress, that which is very unpleasant. So this is going to be what God uses in order to bring about this change. And we're speaking about this time of persecution, Jacob's trouble that is going to bring a change inwardly in the people of God, in Israel. Because earlier they said, yes, God, you are willing to do all these things for us, but we don't want them. We have no desire of that. That attitude is going to be changed by this time, the worst time of persecution of the Jewish people. And that's what this phrase is referring to. He says, and not will be in the quarter anymore your teachers. Meaning those who have truth, they're not going to be in the corner. They're not going to be set aside. Rather, it says, your eyes, they will see your teachers, meaning that you are going to perceive the revelation of God. No longer is his truth, his prophetic revelations going to be put in the corner, shelved, ignored, but they are going to see, and the implication here is they're going to see by experience. These things that the prophet says, they're going to, they're going to be a reality. And one of the things the prophet said is that they're going to suffer severely in the last days. Look, if you would, to verse 21. This is clearly speaking about revelation because it says, your ears shall hear the word which is behind you, meaning that you left your foundation. You have left, you departed from where you've come from. And it's speaking about, most translators see this as the word that the patriarchs received, what they shared, what Moses and the prophets, those in Israel's history, what they have said, their word is behind. And it all is a reference for the necessity 
of repentance. So once again, your ear shall hear the word which is behind you saying, this is the way. The word way, so important. The first believers were called the people of the way. Messiah is known as the way. Both in the Old Testament, of course, that famous verse that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him by that way. So this is the way you shall go in it for to the right or to the left. Meaning from the right or from the left, you need to change. You need to go in the way of the Lord. And it's speaking about a straight way a specific way, not turning to the right or to the left. God's going to bring about a change. This hardship is going to put the people on the right course. This is what he's saying, verse 22. Also prophetically, we see in the last days, up until this time of repentance, which is caused by the great tribulation or suffering of Israel, I want to be clear about something. When I say the great tribulation of Israel, I'm speaking about the time of trouble, Jacob's trouble. Don't confuse that. Don't confuse that with the term in the book of Revelation for the great tribulation because that has more to do with believers than, than with Israel. So I'm just speaking about this time of great tribulation known as Jacob's trouble. Look again at the text, verse, verse 22. Israel, up until that time, is in idolatry. Ezekiel says that, Jeremiah says that, and Isaiah says this. How do we know that? He says, only at this time that you will render unclean, you will defile and this is a good thing. You will defile the covering of your statues of silver. So the statues, the word pasil, pestle, has to do with uh, idols. So he says here, you will identify and, and render them as unclean, as impure, the coverings of your silver idols and the coverings of your, your molten, and these are in other words for statues or idols and such, of gold. And you will throw them, and he says you will throw them as, and it uses the word dava, which is a, and I apologize for the, the language, but simply the, the menstruating rag. You will see these idols that you were committed to, this false teaching, you will see it as menstruating garments and you will cast them away. And he says, you will say, you will say this to, to these idols. Verse 23, some would say you would say this to him, meaning a confession before God that this idolatry is, is defilement. Verse 23, because of this change, notice what God's going to do. He says, and he will give rain for your seed, which you will sow in the ground, and the bread will be produced. You will have a, a produce of bread from the ground, and there will be, and it uses two different Hebrew words for the, the fatness, the richness of the land, and your cattle will, will graze upon the richness, the fatness of the land in that day. And then we have the phrase, kar nirchav. Kar nirchav, two different ways to translate it and understand it. Kar can mean a, a lamb, sheep. It could be a reference to the term flock. The word nirchav means to be brought down. So in the same way that your cattle is going to eat the richness, the, the most fertile, the fatness of the land, your flocks are going to be broad, widened more and more. But this is also an idiom in modern Hebrew. Kar nirchav speaks about having opportunity, having a time of, of prosperity. 
So this is what God's going to do. He's giving them a great opportunity to take hold of a kingdom prosperity. Verse, verse 24. And the cattle, and this is a word for perhaps oxen. It speaks about the herd, but speaking about the cattle, there's going to be many and also many young, young donkeys those that are workers in the ground. And they're going to eat a, a good mixture of, of fodder, a good mixture of, of that food, which is, is plentiful, which is nourishing. It's an expression here for simply as well, the, the good food of the land, which, which, he will sow, meaning that he will, will separate with, and he uses two different uh, instruments for this process of, of willowing, of, of separating that which is good from that which is bad. So it's going to be a, a sifting for the provision, a good provision for the people. Now look at verse 25. And it will come about on every high mountain and upon every hill that is lifted up. And the image here is clear. There's going to be streams, streams of, of water. Notice what it says. Streams and, and tributaries of water in the day of a great, a great slain or a great slaughter. When the falling of the Migdalin, the towers. And what this is speaking about is this. It is going to be the slain, this massive slaughter of the nations. These watchtowers that are falling down. This is an idiom for the nations. Those that persecuted Israel. All the nations of the world that are going to come against Israel in the last days they are going to fall down. There's going to be a great slaughter of them. But on every mountain, and this is a preferred place, there's going to be abundant water, streams of water, tributaries of water, all signify blessing. So God is going to exalt the people, bring them up on the highland, give them a new, new perspective. And they're going to behold the blessings of God. This is what the prophet is saying. Look at verse 36. And it shall come about that the light of the moon is going to be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be seven times, sevenfold, as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord does something. And the day that the Lord binds up the fracture of his people. And in the day that, that the wound of the blow, his blow meaning he is going to bring healing to this time of trouble that was placed upon Israel, it says. And the wound of his blow, and it could be his blow meaning the people's, what they've received, because people is singular in Hebrew, am. So the suffering that the people, he, this is God, he will heal. So we see the first half of our study today deals with God moving. He is going to use this period of suffering for the Jewish people as a way of bringing them to repentance so he can restore, he can heal, and he can provide prosperity, a kingdom prosperity for the people. Now, this is going to be going on as he judges the enemy. And notice what he says here. Look, if you would, to verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord will, will come from a distance. So it's simply speaking about how God's character is so removed from the people. But he is going to come. He's going to return. And he's going to do so. It says, burning with anger and with a heavy burden, 
with lips full of wrath and his tongue as a devouring fire. Now, what does this teach us? This principle that we see over and over. It is going to be God as judge, his wrath poured out upon the world. And this is certainly a reference to wrath. His destroying of the nations that came against Israel in the last days. All of this is going to give rise to Israel's restoration. So now in verse 27, we have God coming from a distance. He seems far because the people weren't interested in him. But now he's returning and he's going to bring judgment, his wrath upon the enemies. Look at verse 28. It continues the same imagery. He reads, and his spirit as a river. Another word, nachal, a river that is flowing, that, that sweeps through unto the neck. And it says that he will divide for, for scattering of the nations. So he's going to come, he is going to scatter the nations, and he's going to sift them. Now, this is a way sifting has to do, and it's the word, the seed, the, the instrument for sifting. But it's going to be, and we have the Hebrew word shav, which means in vain, vanity, futility. What he's speaking about here is that he's going to separate, divide the nations. And you're seeing those things in one sense to remove the bad from the good. But the problem is this, there's not going to be much good. All of this separation, we're not going to see repentance. And this simply supports, by and large, what we see in the book of Revelation. Now let's pause for a moment and get something right. Oftentimes, people speak about the 144,000, they call them Jewish evangelists. Nowhere in the scripture do we see that. This is a, a fabrication. We do not see the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 or in Revelation 14 being evangelists. Just doesn't say it. Nor do we see in the book of Revelation this great, great salvation happening in the, in the last days. We see it happening only to Israel. There is going to be a remnant of, of Gentiles left over after God's wrath, but a very small remnant. What we see over and over in the book of Revelation, read about God's trumpet judgments, about his bold judgments. In the book of Revelation, I'm talking about primarily in chapters 8 and 9 and chapter 16. What you find is this. Despite all of these things that are happening, and it really bothers me when people look at these events and say, well, this is probably nuclear war. No, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with the activity of man. It has to do with God raining down brimstone, fire, sulfur, something that there's no other explanation, but God is bringing it about. Stop those who are so-called uh, uh, interpreters of prophecy stop taking the natural in order to explain the supernatural this is God at work he's manifesting himself and what we see is the people and I'm speaking about the nations now not Israel the nations are not going to respond they're not going to repent that's what the book of Revelation tells us about God's wrath. It does not bring about, about repentance, a change. No, what we see prophetically is that there's going to be a small remnant of the nations in the last days because they see God's faithfulness to the Jewish people that they're going to see and repent, but, but not as an outcome of his wrath as an outcome of his faithfulness to his covenantal promises. So his spirit is going to, to be like a sweeping river unto the neck of the enemy. 
He will divide them and scatter them, and the them is the nations. He's going to sift them, but it's going to be for futility. He is going to put a bridle of deceit in the, the cheeks of the people, meaning this, usually a resen. Resen was for the purpose of leading an animal straight in the right path. But here he's going to lead them to destruction. This is this reference we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that in the last days God will send strong delusion among the people. Verse 29. Now he's going to, in the midst of this judgment, speak about his people. Speaking about Israel, the Jewish people. Verse 29. The song will be to you, you, his people, as in the eve that you sanctify a festival. Now, a festival is thought of in two ways, a time of joy. So it says, a song, song, singing, worship, also joy and happiness comes from singing. A song will be to you as in the eve, in the evening of the time that you sanctify a festival. Gladness of heart as one who walks with a flute. And it says, in order to come to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And I would underscore this rock of Israel because this term is used as a description, as a, we might say, as a, we would say in Hebrew, Shem Kinui, a nickname for Messiah. He's the rock of Israel, the rock of our salvation. So we have a messianic uh, hint in this passage showing that this is the time of Messiah, his second coming for his Old Testament people to bring them to a New Testament faith. Verse 30, and the Lord will be caused to hear, heard, the Lord will make to be heard uh, honor and his voice. He will put his voice he is going to make to be heard, and also he's going to bring down Zoroah. What's that? Zoroah is the arm, and this can be a word for son, descendant. Oftentimes we say the arm. I'm not going to go into a discourse about the significance of that word Zoroah, meaning a sacrificial part of the arm, and also a descendant. These two things coming together, it speaks about Messiah. The arm of the Lord so frequently is used as a reference to the Son of God, the Messiah. So he is going to make low, meaning visible. He's going to send down the second coming of Messiah. And, and he will appear with um, anger and with the flames of fire devouring. And it says... Uh, exploding, and it says uh, willowing, which is sending forth, in this case, sending for, forth stones of hail. Now, it's in the singular, a, a rock of hail. Verse 31, for from the voice of the Lord, there is going to be the destruction, the breaking of Ashur, Assyria. And here again, Assyria is being used symbolically here. This is a last day prophecy being used to speak about this massive empire that wanted to thwart the purposes of God. And so God is going to, as prophecy demands, he is going to bring about retribution on Assyria. Those who were against the things of God, his purpose. He's going to do so with the, the rod. He will strike them with the rod. Verse, verse 32. And it shall come about every uh, staff that passes by a staff of, of discipline. Now, it speaks really a staff that has been established, one that's been laid but the purpose of this staff is, 
It manifests the miracles of God. It manifests the truth of God. It's to lead the people in the proper way. So this word mate, we think about the staff of Moses that he did miracles. It's a source of revelation to bring the people into the will of God, into where God wants them to be. So it will come about that that will pass the staff of, of discipline, which he will set, he, the Lord, the Lord will set upon him, meaning upon the enemy, with, with drums and with violins or harps in battles. And then we have the word tnufa. Tnufa literally means waving, but not waving as hello, but a waving as lifting up your arms and moving them in victory. So in these battles that are going to take place, God is going to manifest victory. And we see here that he is going to fight in it, in this battle for victory. Verse 33, our last verse. For he will arrange. Now, it's literally something that's already been done. I put in the future because it's yet to be done, but in the Hebrew it simply says, he has arranged from yesterday. The times pass at mole. So again, it's happening in the future, but God has already arranged it. It's as it's been done, it's for sure. For he has ranged from yesterday, and then we have a word tophet, and this is a term for hell. The rabbinical commentaries see it as a synonym for Gehinom, Gehenim, or hell. And it says, also he, meaning also for hell, there's a king that's been prepared. Who is that? The Antichrist, Satan. And it says that he will make low and he will broaden the, the flames. And this is where Midura is like a campfire. So he is going to, to do something. Look at it again. He is going to, and it's speaking about the place of eternal judgment. He is going to dig it deeper. It's going to be broader. And the flames of fire are going to be stronger. It's going to have much wood, meaning more, more ability to burn and burn and burn. And what's bringing this about? Well, it says, Nishmat Hashem, the very soul of the Lord. And it speaks about his essence. And his essence is to punish those who reject him, those who have no covenantal condition. So we read that the soul of the Lord as a river, as a river of gofrit, which is sulfur or brimstone, and it's going to burn among it, meaning of this place, Yehinom. So we see in this 30th chapter, God restoring Israel, God putting his wrath upon the enemies, and God casting them into a reference to the, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur forever and ever. This final judgment, the same type of terminology that we see in the book of Revelation 4, God pouring out his wrath in the last days, prior to and bringing about the establishment of his kingdom. So Isaiah chapter 30, what a rich prophetic revelation to us about God's faithfulness to Israel, him being a God of restoration, and him being a God that punishes those who want to stand in opposition to the purposes of God. A great chapter of much revelation that should cause people to understand that replacement theology, thinking that God has cast aside Israel and chosen another, is clearly a false teaching. Well, I'll close with that until next time. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. 
There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.